going to uh, discuss. Um, the we're going to do a uh, Dr. Scott. Yes, and we're going to record this meeting, and we're go we're going to um, send you out uh, send out to um, the camps um, the link to where you can uh, review this again. Um, so Dr. Scott Campbell is going to review the pesticide legislation that came out last year. Just a quick review of that, and then he's going to give you some um, guidance on uh, mosquito and tick prevention. Uh, we also have food allergens and the national safety check we're going to review, and that's going to be done by Christine Bouchard, and Chris Candell will go over the uh, polio virus guidance. Um, but uh, first off, uh, we're getting uh, a number of questions. We can go to the first slide, Christine. So there's no um, guidance that's coming out for um, the COVID-19 uh, for, for this year. Uh, we're going to be, it's going to be treated just like any other communicable disease. So, um, so if a, a camper or staff um, has uh, COVID, uh, you need to do the standard uh, practices for um, preventing communicable diseases in your camp and within 24 hours notify us of the, uh, of the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak or, or case. Um, and, then, uh, and then with the slide, this is the phone number and the email to, to send that uh, to us. Um, so I'll let you go and, um, and Scott Campbell will talk about the pesticide uh, legislation. Hello, everybody. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. All right, great. Okay, so uh, this legislation was enacted uh, last year. So uh, last year was our first year uh, with this law, and uh, hopefully it went well um, and in the camps that, uh, um, you know, obviously followed these, this law. Um, it only applies when the camp is in session, uh, not when it is out of session. A law, this law prohibits, um, with exceptions, which we will discuss, uh, the application of pesticides to any playground, turf, um, turf field, athletic field, or playing field at children's camps. The law allows children's camps to apply an emergency application of the pesticides to these areas. Um, and to address a public health or environmental emergency. And we'll talk about what qualifies uh, to those emergencies. And a fact sheet uh, will be sent out uh, to you all uh, with a review of this legislation. So what is a pesticide? Basically, a pesticide is any substance or mixture targeted as a, at a pest or a, an unwanted plant. So any, any uh, chemical that is going to target a pest to prevent, destroy, repel, or mitigate that pest, or it's going to regulate, uh, defoliate, or desiccate uh, plants. So what are the requirements? Um, all pesticide, pesticide applications at children camps must be done by a DEC certified pesticide, pesticide applicator or technician. Um, workers can't do it unless they have that qualification. Uh, pesticide applicators must adhere to all notification requirements, and, and that includes the neighbor notification law, and that is any application needs a 48-hour notice. Um, any necessary pesticide application to the playground, turf, athletic, or playing fields should be done at least 30 days in advance of the opening of the camp or after the season is over. Um, so what are the exceptions to this, this law? And the exceptions, the antimicrobial pesticides that target um, bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, algae, and slime. So basically cleaning products or something very similar to that. Uh, aerosol products with a directed spray, like a, a wasp spray, uh, with 18 fluid ounces or less 
but again, this has to be applied by a uh, registered uh, DEC pesticide applicator. Um, there are no exceptions to that. Uh, non -vol Non-volatile insect or rodent bait, so something obviously that doesn't give off a, um, a chemical um, vapor um, in a tamper-resistant container. Uh, pesticides classified as uh, exempt under uh, our 40, 40 CFR part 152.25, which are basically what is considered like more of the natural um, products like uh, cedar oil, uh, cinnamon, citronella, those types of uh, products, they're exempt. Boric acid or disodium octoborate tetrahydrate uh, or horticultural soaps or oils. Um, but they cannot contain any kind of synthetic pesticide or synergist. So acceptable applications. Um, so uh, non-exempt pesticides in the area adjacent to playing fields. So you can spray around the playing fields. It just, uh, the, those areas have to be inaccessible to campers, um, even with chasing balls or, or those types of uh, items. Uh, they just have to be able to stay out of the area. Um, they can be fenced, uh, fence barrier, et cetera. Um, the other acceptable uh, application is the use of pesticides along trails between fields um, in accordance to the label, um, as, as we know. But again, no uh, drift or overspray into those uh, playgrounds or uh, other playing fields. Next slide. Um, so, so there are there are exemptions uh, for non-exempt prohibited pesticides. Uh, the, so, the use of a non-exempt prohibited pesticide is warranted when uh, it is used to reduce a public health threat uh, to the safety to um, increase the safety to children and adults present. An example would be an unusual. The key word is unusual infestation of vector populations such as ticks that may carry human pathogens. Um, but it has to be unusual. It can't be a routine population. There would have to be something that elevates it above the routine uh, circumstance. Um, also, situations that may arise in the future, ones that we may not be aware of or be thinking of, um, so that ones that are not identified yet, uh, you know, some sort of uh, emergent uh, threat um, that is unknown to the state of New York. And if you have any um, of those requests for uh, an application um, for non-exempt pro uh, prohibited pesticide, you can contact us at that number or that email address. <clears throat> Examples of non-warrant use. So um, the, uh, the issues that can be managed with the allowed products um, and, and alternative strategies. So if, if those are possible, the uh, exemption probably will not be approved. Um, moving, moving things, uh, putting down wood chips, something like that. If that's that's part of it, uh, of a strategy that would not be um, acceptable. You would not get that exemption. Uh, routine or repetitive press problems like ticks. Again, if it's just they're there, um, that that probably would be considered routine. Um, ticks are, are endemic in Suffolk County, but if there was an outbreak of a certain pathogen or, or, or condition, something like that, then that might uh, rise to the level of, of an exemption. But routine or repetitive pest problems um, are not, uh, do not qualify for an exemption. Uh, pesticide applications for aesthetic reasons, uh, such as the presence of growth or undesirable species is not exempt, and treatment of pests or plants that impact the quality of the turf are not exempt. And so how do we prevent uh, mosquito bites and tick bites? So I'll go over um, that uh, now. So basically to create bites, you want to create barriers and you can create two types of barrier. One is with clothing, that's a physical barrier. And then you can uh, create a, another barrier, uh, a chemical barrier with repellents. And uh, as we know, uh, any kind of um, uh, bug spray uh, repellent needs a permission slip uh, by submitted to the camp by the uh, camper um, or the parents of the camper. 
nets. So uh, it's very similar with uh, uh, tick bites uh, in many ways, but also, uh, you know, mosquitoes fly, ticks crawl. So, um, you know, you can't really avoid mosquitoes. Scott, I don't know if anyone can hear you. Can anyone hear yeah, Scott right now? Yeah, Scott, I don't think we can hear you. Did you call in or are you on your mic? Are you there, Scott? Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay. All right. Um, gotcha. Yeah, so, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's just a little low. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't know where where did I go out? Did I talk about uh, I began talking about tick bites. You're on prevention of tick bites. Yeah. So um, obviously you can avoid tick habitat. Uh, you can't really do that with mosquitoes. They will fly to you. Uh, so there are some differences, obviously, with with tick bite uh, prevention and mosquito bite prevention. But uh, with regarding ticks, you don't want to be work sitting uh, or playing in areas where the ticks are present. Um, walking on paths, you want to stay in the center of the paths um, and not along the grassy edges. Um, maybe uh, more conducive to workers uh, with tucking long pants into socks. Most campers are going to come uh, in shorts is my guess, uh, but that's another way to prevent, you know, that physical barrier of clothing and uh, preventing ticks from crawling up under under clothing. Uh, they will come from the ground or the or the low laying brush, not from trees or uh, anything like that. Um, hats uh, will can hold long hair up off the back, so uh, prevents um, you know the uh, ticks from getting into the hair uh, sooner. Um, you want to check frequently for ticks. Um, it, probably not a bad idea to have a um, frequent tick check, a, a, a camp tick check uh, after um, you know playing in a in a field or walking through a trail or something like that. Um, I would suggest that, and that will hopefully allow campers and staff to find the ticks sooner uh, before they are able to get under uh, clothing uh, and, and attach. Um, the other thing is um, you can treat uh, clothing with a dryer, a clothes dryer um, at the end of the day, and, and you can convey that to the campers as well as staff. Uh, ticks don't like dryness and anything, any ticks on clothing when you put it into a dryer it will dry them out and kill them and once that's dried for 10 minutes um, they will be unable to bite uh, anybody uh, including those in the house that are unsuspecting and doing the laundry so you uh, you can do that uh, pass that information along to the campers as well next so as I mentioned, ticks come from the ground they don't drop from trees they don't fly uh, they don't jump uh, they quest, and that basically allows them to, or causes them to stand on vegetation uh, or leaf leaves, and with their front legs out. And as somebody or something brushes against them, they will attach, gra grapple, grab on with those front legs, and then start crawling on uh, the individual, um, and then looking for a, a site to feed. The second thing is, you no, that's fine. Again, you want to, you want to, because they're on the ground. You want to prevent them from getting under clothing, and this is how we do it. Um, I, again, how how this fits into um, the the camp uh, program uh, may or may not work. Maybe for workers, maybe not for counselors. But uh, really, if you can create that barrier of clothing 
uh, or repellents, you're going to do, do much better with regards to um, the uh, reduction of tick bite exposure. Next. So again, frequent tick checks. And uh, if you can work that into your program, I, I think that would be a great thing. Definitely uh, all campers should do tick checks uh, when they go home as well as staff. Um, and I, I always like to do a tick check the following morning because those little ticks that, that may have attached overnight that you missed uh, during the original tick bite, uh, or tick check rather, um, they, um, they may attach uh, after, after the, the evening and uh, now you're, you're, going, you're going to see them. They're going to be a little bigger uh, because of uh, that, that attachment and that redness that you get on the bite. So check after the, uh, after the camp day is done and the following morning, whenever you brush your teeth, basically. Next. Uh, clothes dryer, it's, it's uh, a camper and a camp staff's best friend. Again, anything they wear outside in, in tick territory, throw in a dryer for 10 minutes and it basically sterilizes them against ticks. Next. Uh, so where do you check for ticks? Well, uh, uh, basically everywhere. Um, you know, ticks can be in belly buttons. They can be in ears, you know, behind ears, uh, especially with children. Uh, they're, they're going, they're, they, they have a tendency to um, um, be found more around the head um, and neck. Um, but but yeah, anywhere that's exposed, but typically they'll end up behind knees uh, in the groin area around waistbands of, of any sort, um, you know, that 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 tightness around skin. That's where they'll stop crawling and they'll attach uh, armpits, uh, elbows behind uh, behind the uh, arms uh, on the back and obviously the ears or uh, scalp. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, Lyme disease. Uh, and, and other tick-borne illnesses can produce a rash. Um, the um, bullseye rash or erythema migraine rash is very typical for um, Lyme disease. It occurs in about 60 to 70 percent of the cases. Doesn't occur in all of them, so it's uh, um, not a given that you will get a rash if you get Lyme disease. But um, but if you do have a rash that looks like this, then you know that you do have Lyme disease, uh, and treatment should should occur. Next. So and and the um, the quality of the uh, rash will may vary on the tones um, or the color tone of the skin. Uh, darker skin, it may more look more like a bruise as opposed to a bullseye rash on a lighter skinned person. Next. OK, so uh, the repellents, what what is out there? Um, there's there's many of them. Uh, they should all the ones that are used uh, should be EPA approved. Uh, EPA approval basically means they're effective against ticks and mosquitoes. Um, there's one that's only used on clothing, and that's permethrin. Uh, there was a study out of University of Rhode Island. Basically, uh, somebody that used permethrin on their shoes and socks uh, were 75 percent, approximately 75 percent less likely to be bitten by a tick. Again, the, the idea is that you want to stop those ticks from, from getting on the person. So, you, you know, by, by spraying permethrin on shoes or socks are going to reduce the risk of being bitten. Uh, that, that application is done while the clothing is not being worn. You allow it to dry for about four hours and then you can wear the, the uh, clothing. Uh, that repellent is good for about six washings, so you don't have to apply it every day. So if they, you have camp shoes and socks and clothing that you're going to wear, um, they, that can be applied and, um, you know, basically weekly um, or if, if it's washed more frequently. But again, you know, uh, just follow the directions. Uh, the other products are, do, are not uh, do not bind to clothing, but uh, can be used on clothing or skin, uh, typically used on skin, and um, um, that will present, uh, prevent any uh, tick exposure on the skin. Again, you want to follow the uh, directions on all repellents. Go ahead. So sunscreen and repellent. Um, again, uh, a camper is allowed to carry these uh, products uh, with the permission of the uh, parent uh, or guardian. Uh, um, sunscreens must be FDA approved um, and uh, the all camps are required to uh, keep record of the permission slips 
uh, for the campers. And um, the um, permission slip should allow, or if, if needed, uh, allow the child that is unable uh, to apply sunscreen or insect repellent uh, when directed uh, by the child and permitted by the parent or guardian and authorized by the camp. So you all are probably all familiar with that, but uh, you want to keep that um, in mind as well. Uh, what do you apply first? Um, the fir you uh, apply the sunscreen first, and then you apply the repellent because you want the repellent on the on the uh, top, right? You don't want to apply the repellent and then uh, apply the sunscreen. Um, it won't work as well. All right. And combined products aren't as effective as separate products. It's better to have a sunscreen and repellent and add them separately, not uh, not a product that has both. Next. OK, so what's what's the business end of the uh, tick? And that and that's what is in the uh, red circle. That's the mouth or biting parts, or technically it's called the hypostome. And that is the only bit of the uh, tick that enters the skin uh, during the bite. Um, they don't burrow into the skin. Uh, they don't slice into the skin. That That is the only piece of the tick that uh, enters the skin while it is uh, attached and feeding. Next. So what is the proper way to do tick removal? And that is to use a fine tipped forceps uh, and grasp the tick as close to the skin as possible and pull it up um, uh, in one fell swoop. Don't twist it. Uh, don't don't tug on it. Um, you know, uh, with with just a, a firm tug up, will remove the tick and hopefully the mouth part. That mouth part, if it remains in uh, the bite, is not infectious. It will eventually slough off. Um, once the tick is removed, you can treat the site with either an alcohol swab uh, or a triple antibiotic and, and put a bandage on it. Next. So what do you do with the tick? It's best to keep the tick um, in case um, the, uh, the individual becomes sick, gets a rash at that site. So if you tape the um, tick to a three by five card and note, note on the three by five card where the tick uh, attached to the individual and the date, um, the rash usually occurs between three to seven days, um, or it can occur up to 30 days. So it's good to have that record um, if, if the tick is attached and is removed. Go ahead. So further information, you can contact us. We ha actually have a lot of information on our website. Uh, you, any questions on ticks can be uh, submitted to tick.prevention in Suffolk County, ny.gov. Any uh, questions on mosquitoes can be submitted to mosquito.prevention at suffolkcountyny.gov. Uh, and there's also additional information on the New York State uh, DOH website and the CDC websites, uh, both on ticks and mosquitoes. Um, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions on ticks, mosquitoes, the law. No, it's a it's a webinar. He's talking about ticks. Let's see the chat. Any questions in the chat? Let's take a look. I don't even know how this works with chat. But I couldn't join the team meeting somehow. If anybody has any questions for Scott, they can either unmute and ask the question or type it into the chat. Yes, I won't be. I'm not going to stay on. Uh, I won't be here for the entire webinar. So um, if you have any uh, tick, mosquito uh, or um, pesticide law application questions, um, it's probably better to do it now. If something does come up, um, you can give it to um, county staff and they will get it uh, to us if they don't know the or get it to me um, if they don't know the uh, the answer. But um, you have me now if you'd like to uh, ask me a question on any of that stuff. I guess not. 
all right, I'm not seeing anything, so um, follow up. If you have a question, you can email. OK. Thank you, everybody. All right, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. You're welcome. All right, I guess I'll just go into my part. Um, if you can't hear me, type it into the chat. <laughs> I'm going to be presenting on food allergens. We good to go, Jeff and Chris, right? Can I just ask, um, I know some people are, are seeing an odd view right now. Can everyone still see the presentation? Is anyone having problems not seeing the presentation? Everyone can still see the PowerPoint? OK, all right, just checking. All right, thanks. Yeah, all you, Christine. OK. All right, uh, so as of 2019, approximately 32 million Americans um, had reported having food allergies, and that was up from 15, only 15 million in 2017. So it's exploding. Like, there are so many people with allergies. Um, and children are the largest group of the population affected by allergens. Um, for that reason, there's something called the Protecting Children with Food Allergies Act. It, it is probably coming soon into law. It was just presented to the Senate. Um, it may or may not affect your camp um, because it is mostly going to be affecting like school lunch programs. Um, but it'll basically, if it gets passed, if it passes the Senate and the House and then gets you know, goes to the president, becomes law. Um, it will affect the national school lunch program and the breakfast programs, and they will have to do certain training requirements to um, be able to prevent, identify, and react properly to children with allergies. Um, re uh, preventing reactions, also having alternatives to give to the children um, so that they won't be happy. Uh, they won't be consuming foods they're allergic to. They can have something else. So if that gets passed, uh, it may or may not affect your camp, but just so you guys know about that and you've heard of it. Um, there are nine types of foods that cause most allergies. Um, a lot of you guys probably already know all these, but new in 2023 is the addition of sesame to that list. Now it's the top nine allergies. Um, because there are already 1.2 million people reporting being allergic to sesame, whether that be sesame oil, sesame seeds, or sesame in um, any any version. So, if you have an allergic reaction, you know your symptoms may include, you know, swelling of the lips, tongue, and mouth. You might have a tingling sensation or difficulty breathing. That's like one of the worst reactions. Um, they could also be gastrointestinal. Um, if there it starts as difficulty breathing, it could go, turn into anaphylactic shock. You could have, uh, you know, that's a life-threatening reaction involving the whole body. Um, a lot of times we see this with bee stings and peanut allergies. So preventing and handling food allergies. I mean, the only way to really prevent an allergy is to avoid the food that brings the reaction. So um, allergens can find their way into food um, by like improper use of things, improper labeling, cross contact of surfaces or equipment. And it only takes a microscopic amount to cause a reaction. So you wanna be aware of the foods in your camp that may contain one of those nine most common food allergens. Um, a good so resource is the um, foodallergy.org website, which can be reached also at that phone number. So what's recommended but not actually required is to just make allergies part of what you discuss with the campers at camp and the counselors. You want to teach, you know, campers maybe how to recognize if someone's having an allergic reaction and tell them to notify their counselor. Um, much like the buddy system, like the campers are with each other. So if one of them is having a reaction, the first line of defense would be maybe for the, you know, other campers to be like, hey, what's going on? Um, sometimes acting quickly if there's a life threatening reaction could really help save a life. Um, just be aware that EpiPens give temporary relief. Um, the person who's had a reaction should always seek medical attention after a reaction. 
So some other recommendations is you want to just keep kind of open communication with the campers parents about child at chill and children's allergies. All right. Some good things to do would be like know how to contact EMT or an ambulance, know where the nearest emergency is, the room is located, know how much time it takes for them to arrive. Take steps to avoid cross contact if you have a food service area and just know generally know the camp's protocol when it comes to allergic reactions. Um, know how all these things will change when you're on a camp trip. So if you're out and you're not in your usual environment, what will happen, you know, if this camper has a reaction, what will you do? Um, so the camp should really be enforcing a no sharing policy amongst the campers for all food and beverages. You know, I think it's been a thing like all along for years, kids, you know, bring a snack they don't like, they trade it with their friend because they like their friend's snack. So no sharing and no trading should really be enforced um, right at the beginning of camp. And the counselors should really be keeping their eyes on the on the campers to make sure that they're not doing this because kids will be kids and kids, kids don't want to eat certain foods. So and someone brings in something really delicious, they might trade. <clears throat> so this sign should be posted to raise employee awareness about food allergies. And it's just going through some of the things that I already talked about. You know, if it, this says customer, but really if someone says they're allergic to a food, uh, you wanna make sure that you take that seriously and you're preventing cross contact. Um, if you are serving food or if you, if the campers are bringing in food, you, you should be able to know which campers have which allergies. Um, if there is a serious life-threatening allergy present at the camp, then that camper should be pointed out by the, you know, to the camp in a discreet way. You want to respect their privacy, but you want to tell the counselor, like, listen, this camper has a severe allergy to this thing um, and make sure that they know that. We had an incident um, involving a chocolate bar. Now, the chocolate bar wasn't any old chocolate bar. It was a chocolate bar um, that contained psilocybin. So the camper took this chocolate bar from the parent um, Psilocybin is a psychedelic compound which has mind altering effects, which include euphoria and visual or mental hallucinations and changes in perception. It can also cause nausea and panic attacks. So what happened with this? So the camper brought the candy bar to camp intending to trade snacks with other campers. Apparently a counselor also had some of it and two campers consumed pieces of the chocolate bar. And then the counselor, I think, after tasting it and being like, that's not right, um, realized it contained drugs and then notified the camp director. So the counselor and the two campers that ate it, they were brought to the nurse um, just to make sure that they were going to be OK. And then they were sent home uh, with their parents. They did all return to the camp after, you know, they didn't really experience any side effects, but it just brought to light you know, the fact that there really shouldn't be any trading or sharing of food, um, not just because this was a piece of chocolate with drugs in it, but because someone could have been severely allergic to, you know, it could have been a chocolate bar with nuts in it, giving it to a, a camper that was has a, you know, severe nut allergy. Um, and that's what could happen. So just uh, highlighting that. So no sharing at the camps. Um, just to turn your attention now to the National Sex Offender Registry. So in June of 2022, uh, legislation was signed that required children's camps to ascertain whether employees or volunteers are on the National Sex Offender Registry using the National Crime Information Center. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, don't we already do this? Um, that is not to be confused with the New York State Sex Offender Registry check. This is in addition to doing what you already do. So both of these checks must be completed um, you have to conduct it prior to the first day that the employee or volunteer will start working at the camp and then every year thereafter prior to their arrival at the camp. So the National Crime Information Center database, it can't actually be accessed by camp operators, but the department will accept checking the staff against the 
United States Department of Justice National Sex Offender Public website, which is listed there. And that's available to the public. So as far as doing this, the directions to do it, you're going to go to that website, nsopw.gov, and you're going to enter the individual's first and last name in the search by name field, and then just click name search. After you agree to the conditions and entering like the CAPTCHA, like click all the boxes that have a bus in it or a motorcycle or whatever, you'll see the results of the search. And the results will indicate that it is including all states, all 50 states and territories in Indian country were performed. So I just included a picture of the website. So you would enter your name there where it says search by name. Um, so now you may be wondering like, well, what if we just type in a, a very common name like, you know, John Smith or something like that. So when you type in the name, it'll come up with any matches that match the name or match an alias that the, the person has used. So when you get the list, it's going to have a picture of the person, their supposedly real name, any listed aliases, and an actual address with the, the street and the state and the town and the state. So you won't be like if you have a counselor or, you know, an employee that is um, has a very common name, you will be able to narrow it down. It's not just going to be a list of names. It's pretty specific. Uh, so that will help you <laughs> knowing that you're, you have the right person. Um, and that's it. That's it for mine. So uh, we'll just hold questions unless you have, you know, you can type them into the chat. We'll go on to Chris's section about polio and then we'll answer questions at the end. So take it away, Chris. Thank you, Christine. So what we're going to talk about now is polio. Oh, Christine, if you don't mind uh, muting yourself, I'm getting a little feedback there. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. So polio, um, and if you want to move to the next one. So um, the reason that we're talking about polio is there was actually a recent case in 2022, a um, paralytic case, actually. Um, it was in an unvaccinated young, um, previously healthy adult in Rockland County. So um, that obviously set up um, several alarms um, to, to see if what other potential cases there are out there, um, paralytic or otherwise. Since then, there has been um, surveillance being conducted in other counties, including Nassau County and in New York City. Thankfully, there are no other paralytic cases, but there have come back um, silent or um, non uh, asymptomatic cases have been coming up. They've been actually testing wastewater. So what happens is polio uh, will live in the gut and will show up in the feces of an individual that has it. So they are seeing in sewage treatment testing that they are actually finding cases um, in counties as close as, as Nassau County. Now, what is polio? Um, many of you may be aware already but it's a highly contagious disease. Um, it's very easily spread, especially for unvaccinated individuals. So a, communities of um, several unvaccinated individuals, it can spread very quickly. Um, it's spread with uh, contact of surfaces, pools, baths that have been contaminated by someone who has the illness, um, especially those who have um, gastrointestinal symptoms. So any sort of fecal matter that's getting in these waters can potentially lead to um, passing on the polio virus. Um, while there is no cure, there is a vaccine. So we'll get into recommendations, but the vaccine is the big, um, really the biggest thing as far as preventing the spread of polio. As far as symptoms go, paralysis is the big one. Weakness of the arms, legs, both. Um, and it could actually lead to permanent disability can also lead to meningitis. And along with that paralysis of muscle, it can actually paralyze the muscles used for breathing, which can actually result in death in some individuals. And children that do develop um, any sort of, or, or children that fully recover can actually end up with symptoms as many as 15 or 40 years later as an adult. Those symptoms can emerge um, even after they've been, um, they've sort of recovered from the illness as children. 
best practices. These none of this is codified. Um, these are all really um, strong recommendations for all of you as camp operators. Um, the big one is just ensuring that all staff um, and campers have received the full series of vaccinations. And I will probably repeat myself a couple times on this. There is no changes as far as the requirements for immunizations. Campers and staff are not required to be immunized, um, but we would have a strong recommendation to make sure, um, especially for the polio virus, that all of our stamp, um, staff and campers um, are, are fully immunized. We want to make sure that we're maintaining adequate disinfection levels in pools for those camps that have pools on site. We will get into that um, on the, the next slide, but there is um, a recommendation to actually increase the, uh, the disinfection level in swimming pools. Uh, we want to encourage hand hygiene. I don't know if you guys are hearing my phone go off without the participants in the lobby. Oops, sorry about that. So we do want to make sure that we're um, practicing proper hand hygiene, um, washing hands, especially after going to the restroom. We want to watch closely for signs of polio. Um, and tied to that is just um, following the camp safety plan, especially when it comes to the daily health check of the campers. Um, and you can also follow the link in the, um, at the bottom of the slide here, and we will provide a copy of the, the presentation to everyone. So you'll be able to follow these links. You don't have to copy it down right this second, but you can actually see the, the rates of vaccination um, within the community following that link below. This is what I discussed as far as the recommendations by New York State to actually um, bump up the disinfection level for swimming pools. So typically in pools, we want to see um, a, a 0.6 on a 1.5 um, parts per million of chlorine, um, depending on the pH level. So that has now right um, risen. We want to see one for a pH of 7.2 to 7.8, and um, three as opposed to 1.5 for for those higher pH levels. And um, bromine, um, we we don't have the, the previous bromine, but we do have um, the increased levels there as well. Um, and I think we only really have one spray ground as far as camps in Suffolk County, but that um, free chlorine recommendation has also gone up. Again, recommendations, but um, strong recommendations to increase those um, disinfection levels in your um, pools and spray grounds. As far as some responsibilities of the camps, um, like I said, campers are not required to be immunized. Um, we do wanna though get records of immunization. We want to um, see which campers are immunized and what campers are not immunized. And for those that are not, we want to make sure that there is a list of campers. So if there is any sort of outbreak or um, of anything, not just polio, any sort of illness outbreak, you know which campers would need to be excluded from camp until the outbreak has passed. Um, and not required, but it is a very good idea to also maintain a list of staff that are not fully vaccinated or uh, fully immunized for the same reason that if there is any sort of outbreak, you'd like those, um, you would want those non-immunized um, staff um, to, to be outside of camp until the outbreak has passed. And camps do have the option to um, require or recommend immunization for both their campers and for their staff. Just general procedures as far as illnesses and outbreaks. Like Jeff mentioned with COVID, there's really no change as far as the reporting procedure. Any sort of communicable illness that is um, at camp, whether it be a camper or a staff member, must be reported to the department within 24 hours. Um, we have the information at the bottom there. You can call or you can email and um, let us know. We want those report forms sent over to us as well, but it's most important that you just reach out, let us know that um, an illness or an outbreak um, and, and injuries as well has occurred at camp just so we're notified um, and, and can kind of walk you along, especially if there's something um, out of the ordinary from, from the typical um, you know, injuries that we'll get at camp. Um, and then especially letting us know if there are any sort of polio symptoms or um, really any sort of um, polio um, illness or outbreak. And then just general, as far as if there is any sort of outbreak at camp, um, procedures that should be followed for, for each camp. 
Um, of course, early identification um, is going to be the most important. That's why we want to do those daily health checks when campers are arriving at camp, whether it's an overnight camp when they're first arriving or for a day camp each day when they're coming in, just doing a general visual health check, making sure everyone um, looks, looks healthy and not ill. Um, if we do end up having any sort of outbreak situation or if you end up do having ill campers, you want to separate the ill from the well as quickly as you can, keep them physically separated. Um, um, and then if it's a, a day camp, you want to make sure that they're separated before they're picked up by their parent or guardian. Um, and that sort of separation can vary based on the illness. Um, so depending on what it is, you may need um, a longer isolation um, or restriction period, again, depending on that illness. Um, anyone that is sent home following an illness or, or any sort of outbreak should um, go and seek immediate atten uh, medical attention from, from, their, um, their, uh, from their physician. Um, any new arrivals, so if you, there is any sort of um, potential outbreak or illness going on and you have new arrivals at camp, you want to make sure that they are um, they're separated from anyone who is either ill or um, still recovering. And then if Again, there is an outbreak going on. You want to make sure that um, potentially limiting any sort of visitors from coming to camp until it has passed. There are just some resources here. Most of these can be found on the New York State website. I have the link there. Um, these are just some hyperlinks. Again, when we send you over a version or a copy of this presentation, you'll be able to follow these links. It'll send you to some PDFs on the New York State website. Um, so just a few over here, procedures for handling vaccine preventable diseases at camp, um, information on polio, both for guidance for you as camp operators and guidance for your parents, uh, your campers' parents. Um, just like I discussed, those procedures for handling outbreaks at camp, as well as our reportable injury and illness poster that lists all of the illnesses and the injuries that are reportable to the department. Um, and, and not on the New York State uh, website, there is um, public health allows uh, New York State camp operators to access the New York State immunization information system, where you can actually go on and check um, immunizations or vaccination status um, for your campers. So this is something that you, um, we can sign you up for essentially. So if a camp is interested, you can email us and let us know, and we can forward you over the appropriate documentation to fill out, send back to us. We submit it to New York State and um, you would be able to gain access to this system. And that is pretty much it. Um, that, that's it for my section. I believe that is it for our presentation here. I know I saw a few questions popping up in the chat here. We can back up a little bit. Um, so it looks like, Christine, we had a question regarding the allergen sign that you had um, in your section of the presentation. Um, would we be able to get them a link for that? Do you know where we got that? Somewhere they'd be able to print that off? We can email that to the uh, camps, the poster. Yeah, I think it was right before this. Yeah, that, that one right there, Christine. Yeah. So yeah, I guess if we have a PDF for that, we can forward that along to everyone along with a copy of the presentation. Okay, I'm sorry, I was muted. But anyway, that's the that's a link right there. Oh, is there a link on the actual slide? Okay, and we could always yeah. yeah, we could always forward it along with the presentation. It will be an obviously a copy of the presentation, but we can we can get everyone a, a copy of that. Um, a question regarding the national um, sex offender registry search. Um, what do they do after the search? Is there anything to print? Um, Jeff, I believe yes, they should be presented with um, a screen saying that that individual um, is not on the the registry. Correct. Yes, and you just have to print the first page and put some notes if it's a multiple page um, a search. So you just, uh, you know, the, the date and time that you did the search and, and, and verifying the name for us. Uh, the state wants you to keep a hard copy this year of, of just the first page of the, of the search for each individual. And there was a question about, uh, if you have another company. So if you have a third party doing the search, uh, when we come out and do our inspection, we're just gonna verify that the national uh, search is part of that 
um, the search that the company is doing for you. So no, you don't have to do it yourself if you have another uh, company doing it for you. And we just need to, you know, just provide us with, you know, the documentation that they are doing that search. It's included in New York State and national. And then just another question regarding that. Yes, this is the first year um, that this is required. This is the first year that the state has um, has instructed us to to do the the national check along with the New York State check. Um, are there any um, parent letters for from the department um, regarding uh, pesticides or polio? There is um, there is a letter for parents to parents or guardians regarding polio that would have been sent out to to all you guys. Um, I think maybe a month or so ago. There are links to that in the presentation um, that you can find on the New York State website. So at the end of the presentation, those resources, one of them is a um, guidance document or an informational document or letter for parents regarding the polio virus. And I'm not sure about pesticides, if there's anything that was developed for um, parents. Do you know, Jeff? No, I don't believe so. Um, so if there is, we'll let you know, but there is that, that guidance document for, for polio. Um, yeah, I see some questions regarding the air quality. This is all sort of new to us um, as, as well. So if there is anything that's gonna come out from the department, may not necessarily be from, from our office, but that is something that, yes, obviously camp season fast approaching, and we're gonna have plenty of kids outside. Um, if there is any sort of um, requirements, guidance, anything like that from the department, we'll be sure to, to relay that over to you. But as of now, there's there's nothing from, from our department. Um, and then any other letters required to be sent home to parents? There, there's really no other um, new new information aside from polio that, that is um, being sent out to parents. Again, if there is something else, we will let you know, but at this point, there's nothing, no other sort of mailers or anything like that um, being discussed for um, to, to send out to parent or guardian. And I think that's a question the polio one is required. It's all strong recommendations. It's a good idea to send it out that, to, to the parents just to let them know that, that it is out there. Um, it is in New York State um, as, you know, as close as Nassau, we're at least seeing um, cases, although asymptomatic, um, nothing um, paralytic, but it, it is a good idea, but not necessarily uh, required as far as um, anything regarding the, the polio. And any other questions, feel free to throw it in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourselves if you have any questions, let us know. So what documentation do you need for harassment training? I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. Is, is, are you referring to the sex offender, the National Sex Offender Registry? I don't know, Kim, if you wanted to unmute yourself and sort of um, elaborate that on that, I'm not quite sure. I guess it's just company based, not through the Board of Health. So that's what I was com um, confused oh, with. I didn't know if you needed that. As far as like training for your for your staff? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, nothing that you would need to send as far as documentation. That would be something that you'd want to just cover in your safety plan regarding the, the staff training at the, okay. the back of the safety template. Yep. So I don't have to document it and keep it with well, my counselor documentation. Unless it's in your safety plan that you're doing so, no. If it's just something that you're you're doing internally as as a uh, camp, it's not something that the department would look for. Okay. So my my camp is also part of a country club. So do you recommend that I have all the other staff that's not part of the camp um, keep records of who 
is not immunized as well or just the camp? What we would be looking for is just for the camp and it would just be kind of a strong recommendation. It, it would be a good idea for, for the country club as a whole to do it. Again, just in case there is any sort of outbreak situation, it's always good to know. But when we're out there, we're focused on camp. So it's gonna be your campers, the campers we want to see. That's what we'll, we'll need to see. A list of anyone that's not immunized, camp staff, strong recommendation, but we wouldn't require. And anyone outside of camp, even though they're on the grounds, we wouldn't necessarily require that, but it would be, it would be a good idea. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you.